Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, our class this morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have completed our study of uh, the book of Acts. This is the first Sunday of Advent. If you're looking at it, watching our class, uh, participating in it um, on our premiere at 930 or even subsequently, you know that uh, Sunday, November 29th is the first Sunday of Advent. And uh, having finished the Acts study, I'd like for us to uh, spend a few weeks during this uh, time of uh, celebrating the birth of our Savior to look at uh, some material uh, concerning the birth of Christ. And if you don't mind, we've followed Luke for a long, long time. Uh, we're going to follow him again for the next few weeks as he tells us about the birth of Christ. When I was uh, a freshman in college, which has been many years ago now, I think I was 18 at the time, and I took a Bible class. And I remember the professor saying that there was evidence, he thought, that Luke actually had an interview with the Virgin Mary. That's been an intriguing thought that's been in the back of my mind for all these years. Uh, in the intervening time, I have encountered a number of scholars who have held to that position. But until recently, I I didn't feel absolutely secure in, in that. I am now, and I'm going to share with you today as this introductory study, uh, the reasons for believing, the, the reasons for the, accepting the evidence that that interview took place. And that's why I call this the conversation. So uh, we're going to be looking at a text, one text. We're going to look at it in depth today. Uh, and answer some questions about Luke and about inspiration and try to tie it together to reach a conclusion. So, uh, uh, as always, uh, certainly it's my prayer, it is my wish that the Holy Spirit be the, our teacher, ultimately, and that truth is taught and uh, that uh, those of you who hear are blessed and that God receives glory. With that in mind, We'll turn to the conversation, uh, and the first part, the first uh, lesson for this, I've entitled The Matters Among Us, The Matters Among Us, and that simply refers to the gospel. It refers to what has happened, uh, what uh, occurred with reference to Christ, and we're going to be looking closely, very closely, at Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Now here's the English Standard Version, which of course uh, uh, is an excellent version for those of us uh, at Stevens Valley. We use this as our um, church text, uh, standard text. It's, it's very good, it's very close to the Greek. Uh, it does, it's not a, a one in which uh, editors make uh, comments or uh, write in such a way as to uh, modernize it. It's a very straightforward, yet it's a very good translation. So let's look at this again, the first four verses, and I know all of you are familiar with them. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now let's look at this in terms of, first of all, the people involved. Who was Theophilus? He writes this to Theophilus. Uh, some people suggest since Theophilus means a friend of God, but maybe this is just symbolic for anyone who loves God. I think not. I think it was he was a real person. But probably Luke was not well acquainted with Theophilus. We don't have a mention of him in any other place. We don't have reason to believe that he was an intimate friend. Luke may have come in contact with him through medical circles. He could have been a fellow doctor. Luke was a doctor. But at any rate, Luke is trying to convert this man. Now, probably Theophilus was a 
distinguished Roman of Greek origin. Uh, many times physicians in the Roman Empire were Greeks. They had a knowledge of medicine and the Romans used them to advantage. Sometimes even they were slaves. Certainly this man was not a slave. He probably was uh, a person who had a high position in the Roman government. If he was a doctor, he may have been a, a doctor to the emperor, some high uh, official. Uh, Theophilus had, <laughs> had been informed about the gospel, but inadequately. And we'll look at that more in detail in a moment. He knew something, but not enough. And at the time that Luke wrote this uh, introduction to the Gospel of Luke, Theophilus was not a Christian. And so Luke, Luke is seeking to convert him and provide him with information that would lead him to certainty. Now, did Luke write with the intention that this would be a gospel that would be spread far and wide? I don't think so. I think he wrote just to Theophilus. But once Theophilus read the letter, and once he came to understand what Luke wrote in it, and we know that he did because by the time Luke wrote Acts, he uh, indicates that he is a Christian. I think then Theophilus would have gladly shared the letter and it became circulated and known as the third of four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, who was Luke? Well, of course, as I've just said, and as all of you know, he was a doctor. He was a physician because Paul said that he was. But he did not parade his medical knowledge. He, he simply um, was concerned about what happened, uh, what happened uh, in the book of Acts with the gospel spreading from Jerusalem to Rome and in the gospel of Luke preceding the first letter to Theopolis, he was concerned about informing him of the matters among us, that is, uh, what happened in the life of Christ. Now, he's also, besides being a doctor, an excellent scientific historian. When we started the study of Acts, I pointed that out. Uh, historians uh, can tend more toward the scientific uh, end of it uh, or more toward the artistic end of it. Science is both, uh, history is both science and art. Now, a scientific historian is an historian who is very meticulous, very particular, very focused on his sources. He wants to make sure that his sources are as close to the fact as possible. And if possible, he's dealing with primary sources, that is eyewitness accounts. And uh, he will not digress from his narrative. He will stick right with it. Uh, more artistic historians use a little more liberty uh, and oftentimes include uh, uh, stories and things that they had heard. Uh, to make it more literary, not so with a scientific historian, not so with an historian like Luke. Now, Luke was also a Greek. His name is Greek, Lucas, and uh, he maybe, probably, came from Antioch. Uh, we can't be sure about that, but I'm going to give you some evidence in a moment <laughs> that might point to that. We do know he was a companion of Paul, on missionary journeys, and he was a faithful companion of Paul. And it's interesting that he wrote, in terms of quantity, uh, one-fourth of the New Testament. And that's interesting because one-fourth of the New Testament was written by a Gentile who was a former pagan. Now, was Luke from Antioch? Well, we know that he was a doctor. That means he would have attended a medical school, and there were numerous medical schools in the uh, uh, Hellenistic part of the Roman Empire, uh, in Antioch, also in Alexandria, also in Ephesus. Uh, Taylor Caldwell, who wrote a, a book, it's a novel, but it's based on her understanding of the life of Luke, uh, had him coming from Antioch, but attending medical school in Alexandria. Again, we don't know for sure about that, but as far as, coming from Antioch, there, it's important if he did come from Antioch, if he did live there, that would answer some questions about his relationship to Paul. Now look at the second bullet point. Anytime we encounter a we passage in Acts, then we may conclude that Luke was with Paul and his company at that time, or Luke is present because he's including himself. That is a 
first person plural pronoun. So it would be Luke plus his company. And the first time that in most versions we encounter it is uh, when Luke joins with Paul and his company, with Silas, uh, at uh, Troas and travels with him, uh, goes as far as Philippi, stays there for a while. We find him again going uh, with Paul uh, to uh, Jerusalem and then on that long voyage to Rome, and he seems to have stayed with Paul in Rome. But there's an interesting passage that is an addition to the usual uh, text of Acts 11.28. Let me explain something for a moment. The English Standard Version that we use is based upon two particular manuscripts. Uh, these manuscripts are the Alexandrian and the Mount Sinai. They are fourth century manuscripts, but they are the oldest complete, uh, or certainly almost complete, uh, manuscripts of the New Testament that are extant. And therefore, most scholars who produce translations today rely upon that textual tradition. However, there's another textual tradition. It is based on manuscripts, extant manuscripts, that are in fact uh, later. And we think, well, if it's later, it's not as reliable. We want to go to the earliest manuscripts. But the tradition of this particular uh, um, series of, of, of texts rests apparently upon manuscripts which are no longer extant, no longer in our possession, but they were, in fact, earlier. That's called the Byzantine tradition. Now, scholars are divided. Most scholars discard that and say, no, that's not reliable. We'll stick with the Alexandrian and the Mount Sinai. But some, on the other hand, especially those who uh, use the King James Version, say that the Byzantine tradition is the better, more accurate. I'll say all of that to say that one of the additions based on that Byzantine tradition is the Codex D, which you see here. It was edited by Theodor Beis, or Beza, who was the successor of John Calvin in Geneva. And you know, of course, Calvin was an excellent Bible scholar, uh, Bayes was also. And in, in his edition, the Codex D uh, by Beza, he has this passage in Acts 11.28 as follows. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And when we had gathered together, one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Now, our versions exclude that and, and simply read, uh, and one of them named Agabus stood up. If this is accurate, and Luke includes himself in this incident that took place when Agabus appeared in Antioch, that is before the Apostle Paul came there. And that would explain how he met Paul namely in Antioch when Paul uh, and uh, Barnabas and Mark appeared there on the first missionary journey and uh, thus became acquainted with him. And when they met uh, in Troas later, it was not uh, Luke meeting Paul for the first time. Now, if you read the text, and we have looked at this before, after the persecution of Saul, remember the disciples were scattered from Jerusalem. And some of them, Luke writes, went to Antioch, and they also went to Phoenicia, and they also went to Cyprus. Now, these disciples who came from Jerusalem to Antioch are responsible for establishing the church in Antioch, which was already there when Paul and Barnabas and Mark arrived. If that is the case, then possibly, and very likely, if Luke was living in Antioch, and he encountered the Christians there who came from Jerusalem. He was probably converted in Antioch before Paul arrived. Now that's significant in understanding that relationship between Luke and Paul. So uh, that would have been in the early 40s. That's a possibility. But I found that extremely interesting. And I just can't dismiss this text 
the, out of hand. I think there, there's a basis, some basis for it. And so, um, whether Luke and, and Paul met each other uh, in that time mentioned in, in Acts 11 with Agabus coming and foretelling uh, the famine, or whether they met later, it is certainly true that Paul became very close to Luke. He called him in Colossians 4.14, 4, the beloved physician. Now, Paul is writing from Rome at this time. Uh, he is writing to the church at Colossae, uh, which, of course, uh, is in uh, Galatia, Asia Minor. And uh, he speaks of Luke, who was obviously with him at that time. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. And at the same time, he wrote the letter to Philemon, who seems to have lived at Colossae. And in the same way, he sends greeting. He says, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So he mentioned Mark and Aristarchus in addition to Demas and Luke when he addresses Philemon. Sometime later, he wrote a second letter to Timothy. And at that time, he said, Luke alone is with me. And remember, he made the statement that Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. And he says, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. So from these passages, we certainly can conclude that Luke was close to Paul. They were very close uh, brothers who loved each other in Christ, and he was a faithful uh, minister of the gospel. Now, uh, that would certainly account for uh, Luke understanding all that happened to Paul, uh, certainly his conversion, and uh, then he was with him for a good part of his ministry. What about other sources for Luke? Well, in Antioch, he would have met Barnabas and learned about his participation in the gospel. He would have met Mark. Mark was not one of the disciples of Christ the, among the 12, but remember his mother Mary. Uh, who was uh, a sister to Barnabas, had a house in Jerusalem, and the disciples met there. And so Mark had every opportunity to meet the apostles and become acquainted with them. And so he had access to many, many witnesses. Uh, it is believed, and I think the tradition is very strong, that Mark was very closely associated with Peter, and that Peter told him and filled him in on much of the information, the early information that Mark as a young man did not have. And uh, if Luke stayed in Rome, which uh, he seems to have done, and if Peter came to Rome, and there seems to be evidence uh, in his, one of his letters when he says those at Babylon greet you, that maybe Babylon is a, a symbol for Rome. Uh, most people believe that he did come there at some point. He did not come before Paul. We know that. But uh, if he came to Rome, and if Luke was in Rome, then Luke would have had ample opportunity to uh, interview Peter. And probably he met Matthew. Uh, he would not let the opportunity pass him by to uh, have a conversation with one of Christ's disciples, apostles. Now, but before we go on, we need to stop and say something here about inspiration. Because you might say, why are you so concerned about Luke uh, having access to witnesses? Uh, Luke was inspired. Uh, would, it wouldn't be necessary for Luke to talk to witnesses. It would simply be that the Spirit would give him, reveal to him this information. So I think we need to look at inspiration for a moment. Uh, here are three passages about inspiration. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God. The Greek word is theopanustos, breathed, God means God breathed, breathed out, and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So scripture is inspired, all of it. It comes from God. It, it is for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, but the end result, the end goal, is the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Second passage, 2 Peter 1, 20. Knowing this first of all, 
that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter is focusing here particularly on prophecy, but it would apply to all scripture because no scripture is produced by the will of man. God is the instigator. God is sovereign over it. Uh, God plans it all out. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Carried along. And then in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 12, Paul said, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interp interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. And so Paul is affirming that as he wrote, and this would be true of anyone who writes Holy Scripture, it is the Spirit who is guiding, it is the Spirit who imparts truth in words, not taught by human wisdom. And so we believe that uh, the words of scripture are those words that are, are provided by the Holy Spirit. And thus we reach conclusions about inspiration. We say it's plenary, it's complete, everything is there. Uh, scripture is not lacking anything because Paul said that the man of God may be complete. And the only way he can be complete is if he has all the truth. And it's verbal. The words that God wants are the words that are in Scripture. That's what Paul wrote in the Corinthian letter. And there are mis no mistakes in it. It comes by the will of God. Men are carried along by the Spirit. It's, it's infallible and it's inerrant. No mistakes. Nothing is false. Inerrant means out of the way. Nothing is out of the way. But was it a matter that the Spirit, uh, let's, say, let's say, was looking over the shoulder and, and dictating? And so the writer of scripture is simply writing down what the spirit gave him to say uh, word for word. Well, some yes. I think the book of Revelation particularly is dictated to the apostle John. Uh, and sometimes some of the, the, the prophets, uh, it, it's just clearly the words that God has given to them. But I don't think that is true for all of inspired writing. Uh, because obviously, in many cases, the personality, the background, the experience, the knowledge, the environment, uh, all of these circumstances play into it, and you can see that. So uh, inspiration does not mean necessarily dictation, but it means that the words that we read in Scripture are the words that God wants. It's complete, and there are no mistakes. Now that, I'm saying that so we can understand, yes, there was a, a reason, and God used Luke uh, to interview these witnesses, and, it, and, and as a part of the a purpose to establish the certainty of it. With that said, I'd like to take you now to this translation by R.C.H. Linsky. Uh, those of you who are in the class know that I have I used Linsky rather uh, widely. I've, I've had the commentaries since I was uh, in college. And uh, he, he's a Lutheran, but very, very good, very um, knowledgeable of, of the Greek text. So here's his translation. This is a more stilted, you might say. It's more word for word. But it, uh, what Lindsay is trying to do is to bring out the meaning of the words. Now we're going to look at this, and then we're going to go even deeper into it by looking at the Greek itself and the nuances of it. But you might see some difference between this translation and what we saw earlier from the ESV. Since many have taken in hand to recount a narrative about the matters among us that have been brought to completion, even as they who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and assistants of the word delivered them to us, I too, resolved after having accurately traced everything from the start to write in an orderly way to you, your excellency, Theophilus, that you may come to realize the certainty of the statements concerning which you have been informed. 
And you see that's the same thing we saw in the ESV, but you see that um, what Linsky is doing is, is, is stressing certain words and certain um, meanings here. Now, let's go a little deeper. And I, in one sense, apologize for um, dealing with the, the Greek, but there's no way other than that to, to get across these nuances and these uh, deeper implications and meanings. So let's take a look at the, <clears throat> the Greek text. Um, I won't propose just to read it all, all to you, but we'll look at some of the words and uh, see what they have to say to us. Now, the reason for doing this, the, the goal in this, is to see if the evidence from this text supports the conclusion that Luke had an interview with the Virgin Mary. That's where we're headed. Okay, uh, the first word uh, means in as much, since, epide uh, uh, pair. Uh, and then the second word on the top line, uh, poloi, is many. Many. That appears in all the translations. Many. That many could have included, probably did included, include Matthew and Mark. The uh, Gospels are arranged in an order. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it appears that that order is very deliberate. If that's the case, then Luke was the third of the four Gospels in order written. I think Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written very close to each other, but I do believe that Luke had access to Matthew's and to Mark's. Now, I read this comment that makes some sense to me. Of course, at first, uh, these were manuscripts that were rolled up in a scroll, and then scrolls were put on a shelf or in a, a drawer or a cabinet or something, and then you draw out a particular, pick up a particular scroll. But in time, um, the scrolls were replaced by the codex. We saw that word a moment ago, C-O-D-E-X, codex. A codex is a book. And with a codex, you have pages and they are bound together. And when you have a codex, it's important to establish the order. It, it seems quite illogical to think that they would have put together a book form if this was not the order in which they were written. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So many thus would be Matthew and would be Mark and probably others. There are traditions of people like Thomas writing and Peter writing a gospel and others. Uh, they're Gnostic, so to speak, they, they are apocryphal, uh, but, uh, and we don't know that they are inspired, but uh, they could have been written, though not necessarily intended by God to be a part of the canon. But they could have been written by these people uh, and among the many that he describes there. So many, now the third word up there is epikeireson, and uh, that word, you see the word with the, the X, the key there, that's care, and that's the word hand. We get that in chiropractor, who he works with his hands. So many have taken in hand, that means they have taken their quill and dipped it in ink, and written. That's the idea. So they've taken in hand, and then this last word on the top line, uh, anatoxasthai, uh, means to write uh, an orderly and complete account. Uh, so, uh, and the complete comes from the first word on the second line, you see there, uh, diagason. Uh, and so those two words put together, which are very seldom used, uh, and that Luke, by the way, has a very advanced vocabulary, which points to the fact that he was a doctor. I've had to translate when I was in college and to translate Luke. It's, uh, his words are technical and they are difficult. And so this particular, these two words that you see here, the last word on the first line, first word on the second line, uh, indicates um, to write a complete, thorough account. And he says, many have done it. Many have taken in hand the pen to write a, a complete account. Account about what? The next word, the second uh, word on the second line, peri, concerning. Concerning what? Well, you come to the last three on that line because this doesn't read in, in English order. The order is completely different. Uh, the last three words there are the words that I've used as a title for this lesson. The things among us in amen uh, pragmaton. 
that last word on the second line is word from which we get pragmatic things, the things among us, the matters among us. So concerning the matters among us, many have taken in hand to write a complete and thorough account of the matters among us. But we've left out that long word in the middle. It's seven syllables long. Excuse me if I don't <laughs> try to pronounce it because, uh, well, I, I, it takes a good deal of time to run through that whole, that long word. But it, the first part of it, the first two letters you see there, P, P, L, Epsilon, uh, that would indicate it's perfect tense. And anytime you see perfect tense, it means something that has been in the past. And in spiritual matters, it means something that God planned from eternity. It's something that has been accomplished now because the tense is past perfect. And that you get from the last part of that word, the last four letters of that word, menoin. Uh, so it's something that God has planned from the past. It's accomplished now, it's done, and it stands forever. So what does it mean? Well, the meaning is in the middle of, of that. It comes from plerao, and that means complete. So what Luke is writing there is that these people have taken in hand to write a thorough account of the matters that have been completely accomplished once and for all, accomplished and done. Now that is significant. It's kind of like Jude saying that the faith is once and for all delivered unto the saints. And so Luke is writing to Theophilus and saying, these are matters that are once and for all settled and have been accomplished. And you can be sure of it, planned by God in eternity, done now at the time I'm writing to you, Theophilus, and they will stand forever. And that's the first two lines. And that's the first verse. Now you come to the third line where you see verse two, kathos, that means even or thus. And the second word, um, paredosan, is handed down. That's the word we get tradition, has handed down. Third word, to us. You mean, what is handed down to us? Um, the things from the beginning, eyewitnesses and servants of the word of the Lord. Uh, these things that are handed down to us, and this is extremely important, are the things that come from uh, the eyewitnesses who have been eyewitnesses from the beginning. Now, if, the, um, if you look at the last uh, five words on that uh, third line, uh, oi up our case, from the beginning. Our case means the beginning, the very beginning of something. So from the beginning, these people who, who took in hand to write this, he calls the autopte, kai uperete. That word, second to last on the third line, autopte, is the word he is using for eyewitness, but nobody else uses it. It's never used elsewhere because the normal word for a, a witness is the word martyrios. We get a word martyr from that. Here's a special word which shows us that Luke was a doctor because this is a medical term. Uh, you would recognize it as the word autopsy. When an autopsy is performed by a doctor, he is looking uh, intently and he's focused for, so that he himself may come to know what caused, for instance, the death of an individual. He's examining the corpse. And this is a word from which we get autopsy. Auto means self and opte, uh, we get optics from that to look, to look for yourself, to look intently. So these people who looked thus, who saw for themselves what? Well, of course, what happened? The, the matter is accomplished among us. That's an eyewitness, but that is a stronger word for eyewitness than we'll find anywhere else. They are eyewitnesses and also they're ministers or servants of the word. That would be the first uh, four words on the, that line, that we, the, the, the fourth line down. Uh, it is translated ministers of the word, but the word is actually, huperete means under rowers. Um, they were the people who were uh, rowing a ship under the command 
of uh, their captain uh, who's in charge or their pilot who's in charge of the rowing. So people who take their orders from the Lord. So they're ministers of the, of the Lord, of, of the word. It says here particularly of the word. So this has happened. He wants the office to know this, that many have taken in hand to write a thorough account uh, of the things that have been completely once and for all finished and accomplished among us. And uh, they who, who did this were um, based their writing on eyewitnesses, people who saw for themselves what happened and were ministers of the word. Now, verse three, edoxe. Uh, it seemed, edoxe means it seemed, I, or I made a, a resolution, I resolved, therefore, I resolved. Kaimoi, kai is and, and I resolve, I myself resolve. Uh, and here we have another seven syllable word. Um, and these are the things that he's writing about that he says he's followed carefully. That long word, the first word on that line, uh, indicates to follow along carefully. Uh, imagine if you see a, a movie where there's a, a car chase, an automobile chase, and so somebody is following uh, another car that's speeding ahead of him, trying to keep up with him. He's following closely, uh, or even a foot chase, uh, somebody following somebody, uh, or even in the sense of uh, you have a, a sports team that you follow closely and read everything about that particular team, uh, or a subject that you're interested in, uh, and so you're going to, to follow it along closely. So we, we can understand what it means to follow something or follow somebody, to follow closely. That means to follow closely for a long time. And then the next word on that line, anothen, it's the same word that we find in, in John 3 when Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot uh, see the kingdom of God. It is a word which literally means, an oath and means from above. So, uh, so yes, it can be again, but it, it has the idea of, uh, it, it, it comes from above. It's, it's the beginning of something. It's, it's from the top, so to speak. Um, like a musician would, or would say, or a, a conductor of a, an orchestra would say, uh, or a director of a play would say, let's take it again from the top. See, again, from the top. So what Luke is saying is, I'm going to take it again, because there are others who've written before me, but I'm going to take it again from the top. I'm going back to the beginning, because I have followed these events for a long time. That word that you see there is a long time, followed closely for a long time. So I'm going to take it from the top. And then it says, uh, the next word is pasin, which means all. That is, all of these things, I've followed all of these things. I'm taking them from the top, from the beginning. And then this next word is very important. Akribos. We've seen that at least twice before, Luke using it. It, it, it means the excellence, the, the very best, the pinnacle. So put this together. And what Luke is saying to Theophilus is, Theophilus, Others have done it, and they've done it well, and they have written complete accounts about these things that are completely accomplished among us. And, and they have uh, based theirs upon eyewitnesses. But I'm going back and doing it all over again, taking it from the top, because I've followed it for a long, long time, very closely, everything, Hassan, everything, and I am satisfied that I have done it correctly. You know, when you, you have written something based on careful research, you look at it and you're satisfied. You're thinking, well, I've done it well. And, and Luke feels like I have everything here. This is all right. That's the acribos. And uh, then the next word after the comma uh, is a word, uh, uh, kathepsis, it means an orderly fashion. So he's going to give it to Theophilus in an orderly fashion that he can understand. He's trying to communicate to Theophilus so he can understand what happened. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily a chronological order. There are 24 chapters in the Gospel of Luke. The first three are chronological, birth of Christ. The last three are chronological, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ and ascension. 
but in between are 18 chapters. Those are not arranged chronologically, but they are arranged in a deliberate order that helps you to understand what happened. So I, I'm writing it down in that kind of an order to you. That's the last word on that line, soy, to you. And then here's the word write, cropsase, writing to you in an orderly manner. And then here's where he addresses, we're down on to the next to the last line. He addresses Theophilus, he says, um, your excellency, Theophilus, Crotiste, we've seen that before. Crotiste, your excellency, Theophilus. And then verse four, verse four, as he concludes, in order, that's the first word is in order, in order, epignos, that you may know. And that word is not the word that means to come to perceive and understand certain things. That word means to know intimately. That means to know from the heart. That means to know in a relational way. That means to know in a way that you approve of that which you've come to know. And it also implies that you are growing in that knowledge. So that's the kind of knowledge I want you to have of those things that have been once and for all accomplished among us. You may know. And then he says, concerning that which you have we, it, we translate this as have been taught, but look at that last word on, on that line. Uh, that is the word uh, uh, katesis, that's the word catechism. We get a word catechism from that. You've been catechized. You understand when we uh, catechize a child or anybody, you go through a catechism, that you're giving the facts, but they may not at that point understand fully what, what you've taught them. It may come later. You have been catechized. You have been taught uh, of the word, the last line there, logo, of the word. And so I'm writing these things so that you may know these things and know them relationally and know them intimately. And then the last word is very important. Asphalking. Uh, asphalking means uh, to, to trip up trip up and you put the alpha in front of it asphalene uh, is uh, without tripping up i want you to know it so thoroughly so intimately that you will not trip up now based on what he's saying let's see if we can reach a conclusion luke said i am writing based on eyewitnesses people who have looked in and seen for themselves, autopsies, looked in and seen for themselves, they're eyewitnesses, as well as uh, servants of the word. And I am, have traced it out from the beginning, the beginning, or, and then he says, from the start. Remember, we t I'm gonna take it from the start, from the beginning. And he emphasizes that at, in two places at least. And I'm writing it in an orderly way. And I'm writing it, Theophilus, so that you will intimately know without tripping up on anything. And then he said, I have researched this with such exactness that I can say from the topmost point, I am satisfied that what I am writing to you is true. Now I ask you, if he has researched everything so that he can tell a complete story from the beginning, from the start, where did it start? It started with the angel coming to Zechariah. It started with the angel then coming to Mary. It started with the material that Luke would have gained from the only person who knew and knew empirically and for certain who Jesus really was, Mary, the Virgin Mary. And for the next few weeks, I would like for us uh, to look at this text not perhaps as we have done it before, just to uh, study a, a Bible text, but to see it intimately, to see it as, as this man who is so passionately concerned about knowing everything about the incidents involving Christ, sits down with the one person who can tell him for sure who Jesus is and how it all started. And, and when we put that personal element on it and look at it as a conversation, I think we're going to see something uh, perhaps a little deeper and more intimate, more meaningful than we have seen. And, and I hope it becomes a blessing for you uh, in this Advent season.
So join us as uh, we continue. Uh, if you're watching this on Sunday, I hope you have a wonderful worship and worship in spirit and in truth. And whatever time you're watching it, uh, certainly that uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you.